So, um, welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Peg Haskellow and I'm the CEO of DASH, the District Alliance for Safe Housing, um, of which NASH, the National Alliance for Safe Housing, is a project. And I'm going to be one of the presenters for the webinar today. Um, we have two other um, amazing staff people from NASH joining us, um, so I want to just introduce you. We have Larissa Kaufman, who is the director of NASH um, with us, as well as Suzanne Marcus, who is DASH's director of training and technical assistance. So the three of us will be uh, presenting this information to you today, and we're really excited to get started. So let me just tell you a little bit about, so what we're here today to focus on is the intersection of domestic and sexual violence and homelessness. And um, let me tell you a little bit about NASH first, and then we can dive into the topic. So NASH, as I mentioned, is a project of the District Alliance for Safe Housing, which is a local safe housing program here in Washington, D.C. Um, NASH is a national training and technical assistance project that was launched in October of 2015. And we're one of the projects, we have project partners um, that we work with, including the Washington State Coalition Against the Domestic Violence and the D.C. Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And we're also one of the federal um, partner, one of the partners of the Federal Domestic Violence and Housing Technical Assistance Consortium, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. So NASH provides programs and communities with tools, strategies, and support necessary to improve coordination between domestic and sexual violence services and homeless and housing providers. So we really focus at the intersection of domestic and sexual violence and, homeless, and housing and homelessness so that survivors and their children can ultimately avoid homelessness as the only means of living free from abuse. We offer a number of different kinds of technical assistance that on various topics, including um, focusing on coordinated entry, helping to build collaborative relationships, uh, focus on trauma-informed practice, rapid rehousing, housing first, flexible funding, as well as federal, state, and local protections. And we'll touch on a little bit of those topics um, in, our, in our webinar today. As I mentioned, we're part of the Domestic Violence and Housing TA Consortium, which is a mouthful, um, but that was launched in 2015, and it's a consortium that provides training, technical assistance, and resource development at the intersection of domestic violence and sexual assault and housing and homeless services. It's funded and supported by a partnership, which um, to me is a really remarkable thing, um, between between the Department of Justice, Office for Victims of Crime, and the Office on Violence Against Women, as well as the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Health and Human Services FIPSA Office. So it's an MOU between those four federal agencies. Um, and then the technical assistance team that is providing support to those federal partners includes NASH, as well as the National Network to End Domestic Violence, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence and Collaborative Solutions, Inc., which is a HUD technical assistance provider. So all together, we work to build and provide technical assistance to both homeless and housing providers as well as domestic violence and sexual assault service providers. One of the things that we, one of the new resources that we launched this year that we're very excited about is our Safe Housing Partnerships website. Um, you can find this at safehousingpartnerships.org, and it's a website that offers a lot of information and resources around the intersection of domestic and sexual violence and homelessness and housing. It has a great deal of um, training information, white papers, you know, briefs, um, research papers all around um, this intersection and is really the first clearinghouse of its kind to pull all of that information together. So if you're looking for additional information on this intersection to help you, um, definitely go to the website. Um, it's well organized and a, has a wealth of information. So today we're going to be looking at the intersection of domestic and sexual violence and homelessness, and we have a few learning objectives. 
Um, the first is to understand the specific barriers that survivors face to accessing and maintaining safe housing. We hope you'll be able to explore the myriad responses to survivors' safe housing needs, ranging from legal protections to innovative housing program models and partnerships across the homeless and victim service sectors. We hope you'll understand the role of, homeless, of the homeless service system and opportunities for partnerships between victim service providers and homeless service providers, and that you can share capacity building tools, trainings, and resources for homeless housing and victim advocates available both through NASH and through the Domestic Violence TA Consortium. So we have um, a few um, uh, items on our agenda to help accomplish this. We're going to look at the intersection of domestic and sexual violence and homelessness broadly, um, where these, these um, two issues really um, intersect, what the barriers are to accessing housing for survivors as well as barriers to maintaining housing for survivors. And then we're going to look at evolving advocacy responses and innovative models to safe housing. And as I said, there will be an opportunity for questions um, both, both via the chat box as well as Q&A after each section. So um, before we get started, we just wanted to do a poll and find out who is in our audience. So if all of you can um, go ahead and let us know if you're calling in from a homeless organization, a domestic violence organization, maybe a sexual assault organization, or a government entity or national organization. This will really help us understand who is participating. It looks like we have mostly domestic violence organizations participating as well as a handful of sexual assault organizations. Welcome and some government and homeless service organizations. So we're really pleased to have you all here. And oh, we've got a few national organizations too. This is great. So we've got some really great um, representation. And then um, is your organization part of the continuum of care? It looks like the majority of you are, about 64%, which is fantastic, and that about a third of you are not participating in your continuum of care. Um, so this is really good. We've got a really great broad section here. Thank you. Um, how do I close out and move on? Okay, great. Thank you. So... So, um, oh, and I did want to mention before we dive into the meat of this issue that, um, that as we're talking about this, I really want to acknowledge um, our project partners who help us develop this material and whose input we really couldn't have um, done, done this without, um, particularly Linda Olson from the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Chris Billhart, who is a national expert on homeless and domestic violence issues and who is our technical assistance specialist with NASH. So I just want to give a shout out to both of them um, as well. So as we look at what our common language is as we're talking about these issues, we just want to make sure that everyone has a consistent vocabulary. When we talk about homelessness, we're talking about an extreme end of the continuum of housing instability. So the federal government considers individuals and families experiencing homelessness to be those that are literally homeless or living somewhere that's not meant for human habitat. Those that are at imminent risk of homelessness or those that are fleeing domestic violence or who are living in emergency shelters and transitional housing, and including to an extent those who are living in doubled up situations. So we're really looking at a broad um, population of people who are experiencing extreme housing instability. When we're talking about sexual violence, we mean any type of sexual contact or behavior that occurs without the explicit consent of the recipient. Um, and this falls under the definition of sexual assault, including sexual activities that are forced, sexual intercourse, forcible sodomy, child molestation, incest, fondling, or attempted rape. 
Domestic violence is a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that's used by one partner to gain and maintain power and control over another intimate partner. And domestic violence could be physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions that threaten or that um, influence another person. Safe housing, when we talk about safe housing, we mean housing that ensures survivors to have access to the means to be safe and self-determining. And finally, the Continuum of Care is a regional or local planning body that coordinates housing and services funding for homeless families and individuals. So hopefully we're all working from the same common language. So let's look a little bit at the intersection of domestic and sexual violence. It's a complex entanglement. For survivors, housing is a huge consideration in, whether, in their decision making in how to co with a violent or abusive um, partner or situation. Escaping domestic violence may mean losing their housing or their income or the ability to sustain housing if, a, if an abuser leaves. So the impact on housing um, has a huge, plays a huge factor in how uh, survivors are able to think about their situations. 50% of sexual assaults take place within a mile of a victim's home, leaving survivors in danger of re-encountering their assailants, which again creates housing instability. Sexual violence can also severely disrupt survivors' lives and increase the likelihood of job loss and homelessness. And many survivors stay in abusive situations in order to remain housed, especially when there are children involved. So it is a really complicated situation for survivors. Past experience with domestic or sexual violence can significantly contribute to chronic homelessness as well. So what we see is that for a lot of survivors, after they experience housing instability, they often are vulnerable to domestic or sexual violence um, as a consequence. 92% of homeless women have experienced severe physical or sexual abuse in their lives. And domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness for women and children. Over 40% of family homelessness is precipitated by domestic violence. And finally, homeless women may seek the perceived safety of a new partner and become the victim of coercive control. So in other words, housing instability can lead to vulnerability through domestic and sexual violence as well. So it's really under, important to understand homeless service systems. While experiences of domestic, sex, domestic violence are pervasive among those who are experiencing homelessness, homeless service systems are not designed to meet all of the needs of survivors of domestic violence, but are instead designed to offer immediate shelter and ideally swift connections to permanent housing. So they're not necessarily in a position to help survivors deal with the um, violence or the abuse that they've experienced, although we know that many survivors do go to homeless housing programs. The key elements and points that we want to make here is that it's, it's important for housing programs to employ a housing first um, approach so that they are um, coming at this from a perspective of screening people in and providing them with housing and then helping them cope with the, the situations that they're dealing with that they are collaborating with victim service providers in order to ensure that survivors have the services that they need, that they're leveraging mainstream systems because, as I said, we know that so many survivors end up in homeless housing programs, so we want to make sure that, um, that there is the opportunity to engage survivors um, and get them the help that they need. That, that systems are using data to drive performance and particularly understanding the extent to which survivors are going to homeless housing programs and to the, the extent to which survivors are facing homelessness. That there are investments 
in affordable housing um, because as we all are aware, um, without um, sufficient and available affordable housing, um, everyone who is uh, housing and stable is also facing homelessness. And finally, that we're using coordinated entry systems to identify and, um, and provide services to survivors who are facing homelessness. So the key points of intersection between home, the homeless service system and the needs of survivors include diversion resources, so flex, uh, enabling the use of flexible funding so that we can help prevent homelessness for survivors and enable them to avoid homelessness and stay stably housed in the community, employing vulnerability assessments so that we have a, a solid understanding of the degree to which uh, individuals and families are facing um, abuse or violence and we are um, equipped to be able to connect them to services, that we're looking at the coordinated entry process and ensuring that survivors aren't made unsafe in that process and that their confidentiality and trauma um, care needs are being attended to that we're connecting to mainstream resources and community-based services and supports throughout the process of identifying and connecting individuals and families to housing and homeless programs. And finally, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, and finally, that we're providing tailored services Oh, sorry, that we're providing tailored services to survivors to ensure that they have um, access to their unique um, needs of providing safety and confidentiality and trauma-informed care, and ultimately that they have access to permanent housing. Survivors who can't maintain their housing are highly vulnerable to re-abuse, as I mentioned before, and domestic and sexual violence interferes with, the, with access to housing and with survivors' success in maintaining it. So that vulnerability to abuse and violence creates a situation for survivors where they um, have difficulty getting into safe housing as well as keeping that safe housing once they've gotten it. Abuse may be ongoing, and abusers often persist in attempting to sabotage survivors' success with maintaining housing. Um, so this is, you know, an ongoing um, issue for survivors. And then economic abuse is often a part of domestic violence as well. So what that looks like is preventing resource acquisition for survivors, preventing him or her from going to work, um, sabotaging their jobs, interfering in their education and skill building, or tampering with their childcare. Um, it prevents their resource use, so withholding bank account information or denying access to money, um, and, and can also look like exploiting resources, so generating debt in survivors' names, um, deliberately failing to uh, pay the bills or ruin a survivor's credit and damage their housing unit or using household income for other things such as drugs or alcohol or gambling. Gambling. So all of these types of economic abuse can ultimately result in a survivor's um, homelessness and housing instability. Other intersecting issues that can compromise stable housing include the trauma impact, and we talked about this a little bit, the ongoing impact that abuse and uh, violence have on survivors' lives, the ongoing legal issues that can result from that, fears around child custody and deportation, which are also associated with ongoing legal issues, um, isolation from social support, so keeping survivors from being able to have connections with their families, their faith communities, or their social networks so that they can move on after being in a violent situation. Stalking prone, is prone by abusers, so um, abusers may continue to stalk survivors even after they've separated in order to, you know, 
create further uh, fear um, of risk and housing instability. Um, the employment history, as we, as we mentioned, can be sabotaged. Um, there may also be criminal records that result from the abuse that can create housing instability for survivors or chemical dependency. Um, and as we mentioned before, bad credit or inexperience with handling money can complicate a survivor's ability to maintain housing. And finally, there's the fear of abandoning household pets. So for sur from some survivors, they may not want to try to get out of an abusive home if it means that they can't take their, their pets with them, which is another complicating factor. So as you can tell, this is a really complicated intersection. It's something that um, we're very concerned about and I'm sure um, that you all are working on too. Before we dive into the barriers um, specific to accessing housing, I just wanted to see if anybody has any questions. And yes, we will be sending out the uh, presentation um, and we will also send out the link to the webinar. Okay. okay. Thanks, I well, just wanted to yeah. chime in really quickly. Um, some folks have definitely been posing questions in the um, chat box and just looking at the time because we have um, so much content to still get through. I think what maybe makes sense is to wait for the questions. You all keep posting them in the chat and we'll respond. And we'll wait and do more Q&A at the end um, and try to get through the content. But if there's any clarifying questions that are posted, um, then we can respond to those um, as well. So I think maybe we can just keep going um, to try to get okay. the content. So, does that sound good? Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. All right, everyone. All right. Well, then questions? I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne Marcus to continue on. Great. Thank you, Peg. <clears throat> Um, I want to first apologize for coughing throughout the presentation. <coughs> I'll try to stifle cough. Um, but I'm excited to talk to you in, de in more detail some of the broad themes that Peg talked about in terms of, um, you know, the particular and unique barriers that survivors face in accessing and maintaining housing. So first let's talk about accessing um, housing. So I was looking actually at the chat and where folks say they are, and I, it sounds like a lot of folks are working on the ground in both domestic violence and homeless housing organizations. So it comes as no surprise to most of you that housing is scarce and hard to find for anybody, um, especially now. Um, but with survivors in particular, it's, it's even more challenging. Um, you know, landlords can afford to be picky now so more than ever, um, and that if Survivor discloses the abusive background, um, and that you know, and sometimes they don't even have to disclose. But if they're working with a program that has you know DV in the name, um, uh, you know, landlords fear harm to their property um, and threat to and see a survivor as a threat to neighbors. And often, um, survivors have a hard time um, getting you know their foot in the door, literally and figuratively. Um, other barriers, Houser, housing providers discriminate based on first impressions. So the impact of trauma, like Peg mentioned, <clears throat> may hurt how a survivor presents um, in terms of her, uh, her or his ability to present as somebody that a landlord might perceive as quote unquote responsible or whatever, or they make assumptions. Um, children accompanying the parent may display trauma-related behaviors. And again, that might be hard for a survivor to make a traditionally, you know, appropriate or smooth first impression with a landlord. And then there's always discrimination based on race, ethnicity, national identity, or religion that's layered on top of this other sort of unique barriers that survivors might face when trying to access affordable housing. And then, as Peg mentioned, economic abuse, it, play, it comes up again and again in this situation. So often as a result of the, the abuse and just the result of poverty and all of that, um, background checks are a barrier for many survivors in finding affordable housing, lack of or bad credit history, including outstanding debt, 
lack of or poor rental history, especially in eviction, um, lack of employment history, or even their source of income, so TANF, SSI, housing vouchers, and a criminal history. All of this um, can come up in background checks or be information that landlords can use to discriminate, um, or sometimes it's discrimination, and um, Larissa will talk about what the protections are, and other times it's not. It's landlords have you know standards around credit history or rental history, and it's really hard to um, support survivors or to advocate for survivors in this situation. Um, another barrier is um, access to transportation, and this is particularly true in folks um, on this call who work in rural areas probably know this more than me and more than a lot of folks, but um, that that lack of transportation is a huge barrier in so many ways, but particularly to finding affordable housing or getting, you know, housing in a location there, they can also access other resources. And pets can be barriers too. Um, sometimes even therapy animals, um, it's hard, even though it's illegal, um, it's hard sometimes for survivors to find um, access to affordable housing when they have animals with them, and there's a cre increased damage um, deposits that are added on top of um, rent and other requirements and fees that can be prohibitive. And then there are barriers to accessing victim-specific housing, and by that I mean domestic violence and sexual assault um, programs, shelters, and other transitional housing programs, and others um, specific to victims. So, so what that means is that um, while these programs typically center on safety and confidentiality and are designed specifically to support survivors in, in need of housing, many still do feel unsafe or marginalized in these programs for a variety of reasons, including um, how the program itself is designed or structured to um, LGBTQ survivors or survivors who, for whatever reason, male survivors or survivors who just don't feel um, safe in, in various environments that um, within a domestic violence or sexual assault program. Um, program eligibility requirements can create barriers for survivors. So often, not often, but from time to time, um, programs screen out survivors who are actually in, in need of safe housing. That could include survivors who aren't immediately fleeing domestic violence um, or sexual assault. Some programs have that requirement. Um, others um, are screen out in terms of addiction or mental health. Again, these are not all legal. But it happens, and we have heard, and I'm sure folks, many of you all on the ground know, know, know too, that um, these are, you know, barriers that survivors do face in accessing um, safe housing. And then, of course, just for the field, there's limited um, and decreasing funding for victim-specific housing. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, these are, these, this is a valuable resource that just isn't, um, isn't funded in, in such a way that the um, resource can meet the need. So, so if the survivor is actually able to access housing, which is quite a, a triumph, then there are barriers to maintaining that housing. So what does that look like? Um, well, there's eviction as a result of discrimination because of the survivor's um, status as a, uh, an abuse um, a victim of abuse. So landlords sometimes evict survivors. Landlords seek to evict if survivors are abused in their home, and this includes contacting the police, calling 911. Many of you might be aware that there is proliferation of nuisance laws. These are crime-free ordinances that penalize survivors and tenants when the police are perceived as being called too many times um, to the premises. So there are jurisdictions around the country that are trying to address these laws and address the negative impact that they have on survivors, but this is a barrier that, that still exists in many places. There are um, the ongoing impact of violence and victimization. So, you know, domestic violence is a cycle. So, you know, even once the survivor is finally able to find a safe um, 
location and safe housing, the stalking and threat of violence can persist and can force survivors to have to frequently relocate. And shelter programs may require survivors to relocate if the survivor's confidentiality or safety is compromised by the abuser. And again, that is very frustrating for a survivor, especially if, um, you know, finding uh, that program to begin with was and often is um, a challenge. So to have to relocate um, just adds, you know, yet another barrier to um, stability. And then there's isolation. So, so isolation is a core component of, you know, the dynamics of domestic violence and what abusers do to maintain power and control. So that ongoing isolation that is a result of the domestic violence from community, friends, and family can erode a survivor's safety net. So that unexpected challenges with such things as childcare, medical emergencies, or car repair can impact um, housing stability. So, you know, we've mentioned economic abuse again and again because it's so um, much a threat and a barrier to um, survivors' ability to maintain housing. Um, batterers commonly use violence or threats of violence and intimidation to keep survivors from working or keeping employment. So, again, um, if they lose their, um, their uh, source of income, then they lose the ability to pay rent and maintain housing. And then this can, like I said, can result in their inability to um, maintain their steady employment. And now I will um, hand it over to Larissa because many of the things I um, mentioned that are barriers are actually against the law. <laughs> and there's lots of amazing ways that advocates in the field over the years uh, lots of strategies they have um, developed to address some of these um, barriers. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I love that. And some of these are actually against the law. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so um, I, we only have one slide dedicated to this, and um, I think I might have said this at another point, but it definitely warrants its own um, webinar and presentation. But just briefly, um, for some of you that may not be familiar, um, there was a battered women's uh, shelter movement, um, also part of the um, women's movement, the second wave women's movement in the 60s and 70s, but specifically focused on domestic violence. And um, essentially, because of the years of advocacy um, around all of these different issues, um, there was movement. Um, there was a movement in terms of um, law enforcement response, and there was movement in terms of criminal justice system response. And um, then inevitably, there on the state and local level, and inevitably, there was movement on the national level. And some of you may be familiar with the Violence Against Women Act. Um, some of you may be more familiar than others. I'm going to give some highlights uh, momentarily. Um, and I will also um, briefly touch on some of the other protections that exist for survivors. But something that I want to add here is that, and it's really important to say, is that um, although, you know, really started as the battered women's shelter movement, um, there are so many facets of that that we don't want to ignore and that over the years have um, been layered and brought to the surface, including um, sexual assault, sexual violence, our partnership with um, sexual assault, the, the sexual violence community um, and advocates, um, human trafficking, and other areas as well, stalking. Um, so that's important to note here. So I'm going to go ahead and give some highlights here of the Violence Against Women Act, really just focusing on um, the protections. So uh, essentially, DAWA, um, DAWA covers pretty much all programs that you all most likely have contact with, those of you that work in DV and SA. Um, and that includes public housing, Section 8 voucher, project-based housing, programs that receive um, McKinney-Vinto funds, which essentially are included in the COC. Um, many of you are um, representing COCs here today as well. Um, so let's take a look at VAWA itself. Something I want to add that's really important is that VAWA does not extend to private housing. Uh, so it covers public housing and the COC, so shelters. Um, so VAWA applies to survivors regardless of sex, 
gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, or age. Um, it provides housing protections to survivors of dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and also applies to an individual affiliated um, with the survivor. So it includes individuals who are not on the lease, but are in the survivor's immediate family or, in, or an individual living in the household. So under VAWA, survivors have the right to be accepted into a shelter or housing program. So for example, a housing provider cannot deny an applicant um, housing or assistance because they are a survivor. Um, they have the right to remove the batter from public housing lease or Section 8 housing um, choice voucher and stay in the unit. Um, that's also known as uh, lease bifurcation. Um, survivors have the right to ensure that the housing authority Section 8 landlords honor a civil protection order, uh, specifically if it addresses the batter's access to the unit. They have the right to port, which means to move to another location, specifically if there's a Section 8 voucher, um, so long as it's within that housing authority's jurisdiction. They have a right to seek an emergency transfer. They have a right to stay in the unit, even if there is or has been criminal activity that's directly connected to the domestic violence. Um, they also have a right, I'm going to just add this in here because um, it wasn't mentioned earlier on, but it's important. I know many of you have confronted this or may confront it. Um, they have a right to have access to the unit if they apply to be in that unit, even if they have a criminal history or criminal record, as long as that is connected to the domestic violence. So that's part of the discrimination protections that exist for survivors. So if the criminal record or criminal history is connected to domestic violence, then um, they cannot be denied access or should not be denied access to that unit. Um, they have a right to confidentiality of information um, about the DV, uh, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. Uh, the information can only be shared if requested by the survivor in writing um, and is required for use in an eviction proceeding or by law. Other protections uh, include fair housing, the Fair Housing Act, uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, the ADA. And important here to note that um, on the local and state level, there are many of you out there that have additional protections, and sometimes they also extend to private landlords. Really important for you all to become familiar with what you have on the state and local level. Um, those are great tools as advocates and tools for survivors to share with them. Um, some of you have um, eviction protections, early lease termination, um, the ability to get out of that lease, uh, the ability for a survivor to act, ask to have her locks changed, not be charged with more money than someone else who would make that request, the ability for a survivor to ask for reasonable accommodations um, in restoring or improving security and safety, um, also extended fair housing protections, that's the anti-discrimination protections. So that's my, my, my short there on um, the Violence Against Women Act, some of the other federal protections, and um, some of what you all may have on the state and local level. Um, I'm going to shift into um, strategies and approaches for removing barriers to safe housing. So resources have largely focused on emergency shelter and temporary housing. And as many of you know, shelters and transitional housing are only a temporary solution. Um, in fact, one of you asked early on um, in, the Q, in the question discussion, um, when, when is the best time to let survivors know or talk to them about housing? Is it when they get into shelter? And actually, I'm going to bring that out during Q&A because it's an important question. Um, so there's been a growing emphasis on expanding, expanding and broadening the movement's focus from crisis, crisis shelter to creating access for survivors throughout the housing continuum. Um, so with the housing protections in play, there are ways for survivors to keep their current housing or find housing and not be discriminated against. Um, providing flexible funding, Programs that provide flexible funding to survivors um, can often help them either get access to housing, get a unit, or stay in a unit. 
And some programs offer mobile advocacy as well. So helping survivors remain in their homes if they choose, very important. Um, a couple of safe housing options that have grown over the years. So safe rapid rehousing and flexible engagement models. Um, domestic Violence Housing First, so the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence model. Uh, Peg mentioned uh, Linda earlier, who contributed to this webinar and is also with Skidiv as one of our project partners. Uh, safe Emergency and Transitional Housing. Safe Permanent Supportive Housing. Safe Subsidized Housing with Services Available. So looking at enhancing safety and access for survivors within the homeless and housing system. So looking at coordinating assessment and entry systems to make sure they include safety, safety and confidentiality for survivors. Many of you are connected to your COCs. Uh-oh, I just lost my um, connection to the webinar. So let me, give me a moment. I'm gonna keep going based on my PowerPoint and then I will chime back in to get full access. So, Okay, uh, we can hear you. I got it. Okay, good. Okay, so many of you are connected to your COC or part of your COC, those of you that are domestic violence and sexual assault providers. Um, it's really important to build those relationships. I know for many of you, you've had them for some time, and for some of you, you don't have them just yet. And vice versa, for folks in the homeless community, homeless who work or homeless organizations, homeless providers, um, working with your uh, local and state level domestic violence and sexual assault programs, extremely important. That's how we're able to keep um, the safety and confidentiality at the forefront. And making sure that survivors, um, who making it safe for survivors to disclose, considering trauma-informed assessment, trauma-informed practices, um, physical space and privacy, very important. And creating access, is what I just mentioned, to DV and um, sexual assault services throughout the, um, the housing and homeless system. Creating confidentiality. This also is something that warrants its own um, webinar and something that you all can hopefully look forward to in the coming months um, that we'll be providing support around and many of you are already receiving some support around. And that has to do with data, the data system. So um, providing survivors the option to opt in rather than opt out of central databases and other client systems, that's not just coordinated entry, but many of you may think of coordinated entry when you hear that. Um, understanding that victim service providers, um, what they can and can't disclose, um, and developing comparable databases for survivors rather than utilizing HMIS um, for, for um, survivor data and information. Uh, and extremely importantly, and the last content slide for us before we go into Q&A is enhancing partnerships between the field. Um, really utilizing um, DV experts um, to help with safety and privacy issues, um, making it access, making, making services accessible across, um, across the fields, um, making housing resources and housing tools available, um, and having DV and sexual assault programs provide ongoing input as to how um, homeless and housing systems can work for survivors. So those are, those are the, the big areas that we wanted to cover today, and I'm going to try to get myself logged back in. Um, so I'm going to actually pass this over to either Peg or Suzanne, who still has visible access to the um, to the site. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Larissa. This is Peg again. <laughs> So um, as, as you all see, we've got um, our contact information there for you, but I think we have an opportunity to ask some um, questions. Um, you know, if, you, if anybody has um, questions that they would like to ask, they can uh, put it in the chat box. So we have, we have a question from... It looks like Lynn Rocker 
says, recently we have found that survivors are unaware of the Violence Against Women Act housing protections, and although the housing authorities will send the information, they do not explain what the rights provide them. We found that there was an increase in eviction due to damage to the property or police presence. That in turn leads to ineligible, ineligibility to emergency shelter assistance, eviction on their records, or loss of other types of housing assistance. We have coordinated with our local community legal aid, but often it is too late. Is there something others are, is this something others are seeing? So um, Suzanne <laughs> or Larissa, yeah, if you all want to jump in. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, Larissa, why don't you take away? Yeah, I just wanted to add that it sounds like other folks are saying yes, yes, yes. So Larissa. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So I will, um, tackle this question. So great question. Um, I think it comes up a lot. It actually just came up recently um, in some TA that we were, were providing. Um, so uh, something that we found across the board is that survivors are um, not really aware of what their rights are. And so what we, something that we suggest is really important is to access what already exists um, out there. There are some programs that have great brochures that are provided to survivors. Um, NAS is going to be working on a toolkit for advocates with different scenarios, so you can take a look and see if that scenario applies and take a look and see what the rights are for, um, for survivors. It's unbelievably important that survivors understand what their rights are so that they can utilize them. Um, so I just want to say before I get into the eviction piece of the question, the specific part about property damage, that um, it's something that's at the forefront of our minds in terms of what we can um, help provide training and technical assistance around. Um, and we hope that the programs who are on right now, who are um, domestic violence and sexual assault programs, um, utilize what we provide and utilize what's out there. The National Housing Law Project has a great brochure um, that is just really simple and just states what the rights are, not just under VALA, but fair housing in general. Um, so that's a great brochure, and actually I can include it with um, the webinar slides um, when I um, send those out after the webinar today. So and I just want to say, Larissa, yeah. Larissa, this is Suzanne. Before you jump into the eviction piece, I, I would just want to add with those resources, something that DASH has done over the years in terms of getting that information to survivors. Um, so what we've done, we do housing clinics in the community, which is one way, you know, to get that information out there um, and partnering with the public housing authority. So we used to have um, information tables with information about housing rights um, at the place where survivors were accessing um, subsidized housing. So those are partnerships um, and opportunities for getting the information out there. Sorry, I just wanted to add that. Now I appreciate that you added the strategy piece on the ground, too. No, that was really helpful. Um, and can you also, Suzanne, just briefly before I get into the eviction question, um, can you mention um, how, you know, the Public Housing Authority and also, mm -hmm. I think, generally, um, housing managers are pretty receptive mm -hmm. <laughs> to that kind of collaboration, or we have found? Yes. We have found? Yes. Can you talk about that yes. just a little bit? Very receptive because um, not only in addition to providing the information to survivors, um, we were helping them sort of navigate the process. So they were actually um, the folks in the public housing authority were reaching out um, to our advocates to help them um, implement um, survivors' VAWA protection. So in many cases, our advocates were working hand in hand with them, and we were all we were also offering training for staff for the Public Housing Authority staff, um, which was a great benefit to them. So those are, those are um, partnerships that are sometimes challenging to forge, um, and we actually did that through a domestic violence and housing task force that we developed to help um, DC coordinate their advocacy around the inter this intersection. So a lot of really great things on the ground came out of that, and that um, this partnership with the Public Housing Authority is, is, is one of them. Thanks, Suzanne. And I want to add, um, in terms of the development of a task force or sort of a joint coalition, that there are a couple of communities out there that have something like that specific to domestic violence, sexual assault, and housing um, that we are talking to. So if you're interested in that and want some more strategies, um, 
definitely reach out to us. So now everyone is, is waiting for the response to the increased eviction due to damages to property or police presence. And the response is, is that that's not lawful. If the damages are connected to domestic violence, contacting the police or connected to the domestic violence, it's unlawful under VAWA to, um, to terminate the tenancy um, because it's connected to domestic violence and that's essentially discriminating against the survivor um, because of the DV. So it is not lawful. Um, there are some great demand letters out there for advocates who are wondering how do you respond to this? How do you get it? How do you do this before um, it's too late and the survivor's already evicted and possibly homeless? Um, so uh, there's definitely information that we can provide um, for those of you that are wondering if you know there's a demand letter that you can have access to to address that. But that's, that's essentially the answer. It's not lawful. Um, and there's a way to um, intervene and provide that information to the um, housing provider and or housing authority um, to make sure that that stops. I also want to add, Lynn, I'm not sure where you're located, um, but I think it's really important um, to contact your housing authority if you don't have relationships with them yet and let them know from the get-go that this is happening, that you all have seen an increase in this, that it's unlawful. Um, and um, and try to work with them on that end to um, further the education of the um, the housing managers and those that are um, essentially um, evicting the survivors um, because it's it's illegal. Okay, we had another question um, from Marcy um, before Lynn. Great question um, that says, can't HMIS be utilized for survivors by de-identifying them? Do, you, uh, do one of you all want to take that? Did you all catch the question? Yeah. I. Um I don't, I think. Sorry, I didn't hear the question, yeah. but I'll, I'll wait. Suzanne, go ahead, and then I will. No, no, no. It's about whether or not HMIS can be used for survivors if de-identifying information can be incorporated or used. Right. So, okay. Martha, do you, so the answer, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Well, so the answer is that it's somewhat complicated, but then it's also simple. Um, that um, there are federal laws prohibiting information um, specific information um, that that is not there's there's the, Val, the Violence Against Women Act um, and other federal laws and some state and local laws also prohibit the information from going into HMIS. Um, that's the short and dirty of it. Only only certain kinds of information can be gathered, and we found that most systems um, that that are HMIS systems do not have a way to. Um, to do that. So de-identifying the information isn't enough. Um, that's also something that I know many of you have questions about. We can um, provide some additional resources um, as well when we send out um, the webinar slides and the, um, the brochure. Great. Does anyone have any other questions? I see a number of folks uh, talking about HMIS. Um, there have been some questions about um, whether or not there will be a training certificate available for this. We can certainly, you know, make one available to uh, folks who are interested. And Larissa, I've uh, offered your contact information as the uh, as the person to contact to get that. That sounds good. That sounds good. And then okay. we'll connect you all to our um, coordinator um, who will send them out. Yes, if you need um, a certificate or verification that you were part of the um, training, definitely feel free to shoot me an email. Great. Do we have other questions? There was someone who was interested in getting a contact um, for t around tenants' rights, Larissa. Do we have a contact for that? 
So, um, so tenant rights are really localized on the state level. Mm -hmm. So we may not have that contact for you, but I recommend contacting your legal aid um, to find out um, which organization might be helpful on the ground. And I also just want to add, because I don't want HMIS and aggregate data to just sort of slip away here, um, because our, you know, our webinar is really an overview, um, and I know many of you have questions around this, um, we receive requests around this regularly, that um, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, one of our partners, um, has some really, really great information um, around, um, around this um, and around data collection. And so um, we'll provide their contact information as well if you don't have it. Um, but we'll include some of that um, in terms of resource and materials, too. And, and right. feel free to follow up with us, absolutely, if you have additional questions around it. I think uh, we've been providing some comprehensive technical assistance around that um, across the country. So speaking of TA, I see somebody um, in the comment box, May um, Mua, uh, Mou, M-O-U-A. Um, mentioned that they are launching with new funding a rental housing pilot program with the with this intersection of housing and DV, which is wonderful. Yay! Be curious to know where you are um, because that is wonderful. And um, absolutely, there is um, technical assistance to provide support. We um, as part of this series, um, and I don't know the. Um, a part of this um, NASH series, we have um, Linda Olson and Chris Billhart are going to be presenting a webinar about um, domestic violence housing first and rapid rehousing for survivors and some of the other pieces um, that are connected to that, like mobile advocacy and flexible funding, um, which are really important in rental housing um, programs for survivors. Um, but just a general yes. And um, that is something that the that Nash um, is a resource around is how to support programs like this. Um, and there are also um, wonderful resources at the SafeHousingPartnerships.org website around um, uh, strategies for supporting survivors and work um, in housing, accessing housing, working with landlords, um, flexible funding, all of those things. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Before we um, close out, I actually want to just quickly respond to one more question. We have three minutes. It looks like it got lost in the shuffle, but was just flagged for me. Um, and then I also want to highlight one other webinar that's coming up in December, too, um, that might interest um, some of you participating here. So the question is from Michelle, and it is, we recently worked with a client who was able to secure housing in another unit, but there was an increase in her rent. Is that legal? So the answer is, I'm not sure. Um, was it connected to the domestic violence? If it was connected to the domestic violence, um, that layers it a bit. Um, you know, it, it's not lawful to charge someone more rent than you would charge uh, someone who is not a domestic violence provider. Um, so if that is the case, then there are definitely issues, legal uh, issues with it being unlawful. Um, but I know it's not always that cut and dry. So if, if you, Michelle, want to reach out to me, I'm happy to chat more, um, shoot me an email. Uh, the other webinar I wanted to mention on top of what Susie had mentioned in the resources is um, an upcoming webinar that uh, NASH is doing with the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, uh, NNEDV, as well as Collaborative Solutions, Inc. And it's, uh, the, our audience is uh, domestic violence and sexual assault providers, and we are focusing on coordinated entry. So we are doing that webinar in uh, early December, and look out for more information about that. Um, hoping to have some of you all join. We know there are many questions out there around coordinated entry specifically. Some of you um, are knee deep in working on that, and some of you are not quite sure what it is. And so this 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 webinar is going to cover the gamut. Um, I just wanted to do a quick plug there, and in my last one minute. We'll be um, including an evaluation. We'd love to hear from you, your feedback, uh, what you liked, um, offering suggestions. And also, there's a way to ask specifically for technical assistance and training from NASH on um, a range of areas in that evaluation. So if you want to do the evaluation, not shoot us an email separately and just put your contact information there with your specific TA or training needs. 
um, then we'll be responding to those as well. So thank you all. Thank you so very, very much for participating in our webinar. Um, we are excited to be hosting many of these. These are our first one of about 11 or 12 upcoming in the next couple of months. So look out for, look out for those webinars and new materials that are coming out. And thank you, Peg and Suzanne and the National Resource Center um, for um, hosting us on your, um, on your webinar capabilities um, and for all the support you provided and for the service you did closed captioning. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Look out Thank for that you, everyone. evaluation.